Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second of a series around our Voices of LA survey series. I want to begin this afternoon by thanking uh, Dr. Rafe Sonenshine and the team at the Pat Brown Institute for Public Affairs uh, for what is a tremendous asset to our collective efforts to truly build an authentic multiracial democracy here in LA County. And I'm just so uh, thrilled uh, for California Community Foundation to have an opportunity to partner with Pat Brown Institute's polling series, which for years has been helping to uplift uh, the critical voices that make up our multiracial democracy here in LA County from the African-American survey of LA County voters uh, to now even the largest AAPI uh, survey of LA County AAPI communities. I wanna just say that for California Community Foundation, uh, this has been a great journey and a transformative journey in this partnership from the standpoint of ensuring that as we plot our path forward, we are centering the voices of those being affected in different ways uh, through data and research like this. And so before I turn it over to Dr. Sonenshine, I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank our tremendous panel uh, for coming and really breathing life into this data, which is the intent of a study like this. And also thank the tremendous work of Matt Barreto and the team at uh, BSP Research for the great work in producing this data. And with that, uh, Dr. Sonenshine, we'll hand it over to you for what it is going to be an exciting conversation. Thank you, Efrain. And again, my welcome to everybody. And, uh, our deep thanks to the California Community Foundation, to Efrain and Antonia Hernandez for their support and real partnership in this project. In 2016, the Pat Brown Institute began a very unusual survey program that we've been conducting ever since, which is to do deep dives into four major racial and ethnic communities of Los Angeles County, the African-American community, the Latino community, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community and the Jewish community. And unlike many surveys where these communities end up as a small number in a larger sample, when it's difficult to make real conclusions, we began to use very large samples, 1,500 to 2,100 uh, respondents with the ability to break things down into smaller pieces because of the size of that sample. But as Efrain points out, our real goal throughout has been to uplift the voices of LA. Instead of making assumptions about what members of these communities think and feel, to ask them what they're thinking and what they're feeling, report it outward and in two ways, hold a mirror to the community itself, but also help explain the community within the larger community of Los Angeles. Our first surveys in 2016 were the AAPI and the Latino survey in 2019, the African American and Jewish surveys. And this year, with full support and partnership from the California Community Foundation, we're delighted to be able to have released our new Latino Latina survey uh, a few weeks ago. And today, we believe one of the largest surveys ever done of the AAPI community in one geographic area. And it happens to be an area which is a center of AAPI life uh, throughout the United States. The way the program will go uh, is that we'll have a presentation by Nathan Chan, who I will introduce in just a moment. But before I introduce Nathan, I just wanna thank a few other people, which is Matt Barreto and BSP, who really did the, provided the oversight and leadership for both surveys in association with PBI. I'd also like to thank one of our former staff members, Max Baumgarten, who played a very important role in these projects coming to fruition. And I'm delighted that he gets to see uh, the impact of his work today. And now just to begin, we will have Nathan uh, present the, some summary material about the survey. And then we will have a wonderful panel uh, who I will introduce of three highly 
skilled, motivated, and community-oriented people who will respond in a conversation with me. You can throw your questions and comments into the Q&A. We're not going to break it up and have q and I'll try to work some of the Q&A into the conversation. And now let me introduce Nathan Chan. Uh, Nathan is uh, the research associate at the Pat Brown Institute and was intimately involved in the development of both of our surveys, the Latino and the AAPI survey. He's a PhD candidate in political science at the University of California, Irvine. His specialty is race, ethnicity, and politics, and he is on his way to what's going to be a very stellar career as a scholar of all these issues, but to his credit, he is always concerned and interested in how it affects the communities where people actually live. Uh, and that's why he's been such a great uh, fit for this survey. His research has already been published in top academic journals. Uh, he just got back from giving a paper at an academic convention this weekend. Uh, and to our joy, although we will miss him, in fall of 2022, he will take a position as assistant professor of political science at Loyola Marymount University, where he'll, he'll still be in the family because LMU and the Center for the Study of LA, we consider them our cousins in the professional world. So without any further ado, Nathan, why don't you go ahead and uh, present the data? Thank you, Dr. Sunshine, And thank you all for your interest in the Voices of LA API survey. Um, as Dr. Sun and Chen mentioned, my name is Nathan, and I'll be presenting some of the results today, but let me go ahead and begin by sharing my screen. Okay. So again, thank you all for your interest um, in this survey today. I'll be presenting results from what we call PBI's Voices of LA um, API survey. And this is a companion study to our Voices of LA Latino survey, Latino survey, which we just released a couple of weeks ago. So we encourage you all to tweet along during the presentation um, if you find a specific set of results interesting. Um, and we've listed uh, the Pat Brown Institute's um, California Community Foundations and my Twitter handle here as well. So feel free to tweet along as we go through the presentation today. So what's really important to note is that the AAPI community in Los Angeles has been rapidly growing over the last several decades. And according to data from the US Census, a little more than um, 1,300,000 residents identified as Asian alone in 2010. And um, this made up approximately 13.7% of LA County's population. And this number has grown to about 15, uh, uh, 1,500,000 who identified as Asian alone, about 15% of LA County in the 2020 census. The API community in Los Angeles County is composed of differences across national origin. Um, PBI is planning to do a more in-depth analysis and discussion specifically of Pacific Islanders. However, for today, we'll present primarily survey results from the six largest groups in LA County, Chinese Americans, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Indian Americans. And it's crucial that we continuously kind of give attention in these surveys to the AAPI community, especially in Los Angeles, as AAPI voters are the fastest and an ever-growing portion of the voting electorate. So as I begin, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the methodology that, that um, BSP research um, kind of undertook in order to survey um, Asian American Pacific Islanders in Los Angeles. And this is, as Dr. Sun and Shine mentioned, the second of our API surveys, the first that was conducted in 2016. So here, the Voices of LA API survey included 1,500 respondents in Los Angeles County, and this is one of the largest surveys of APIs in one given area. The survey uniquely was made available in English, Spanish, Chinese, um, both simplified and traditional, Tagalog, and Korean. So each API respondent was able to take our survey in the language that they were most comfortable with. And our survey was conducted on the phone and online. Respondents were randomly selected and recruited through different outlets, including text, email, apps, and online panels. And the survey, again, was implemented by BSP Research under, under the direction of Dr. Matt Barreto at UCLA and was fielded between November 8th and December 24th of 2021. 
So we kind of like to start by highlighting three major topics that we're going to cover in this presentation. The first is the prevalence of anti-Asian hate and discrimination during COVID-19. Our survey found that one fourth of AAPIs in Los Angeles reported being victim of a hate incident crime during the pandemic, and more than half of APIs have fully experienced racial discrimination in the US. In the wake of discrimination and hate, our survey found that um, AAPIs hold a strong sense of solidarity with other Asian Americans. In addition to anti-Asian hate and discrimination, our survey also revealed a bit about where APIs stand um, in LA on various policy and political issues. APIs were most concerned about homelessness and of course the pandemic. We will also discuss their views on police funding and uncover their preference towards the Democratic Party. Lastly, we'll highlight API involvement in politics. We found that APIs are very likely to and enthusiastic about voting in the 2020 midterm election. And they're also overwhelmingly interested in more API elected officials representing them in politics. So even apart from voting, APIs have been active in different forms of political engagement, ranging from volunteering to political campaigns um, and attending protests and rallies as we've seen across the United States within the last two years. Asian Americans fully have not stayed quiet and instead they've been highly active in the midst of increases in anti-Asian hate and discrimination. So let's get right to the data. In regards to the economic impact of the pandemic, about one third of APIs have experienced some kind of employment issue. Our survey found that 13% um, had lost a job and 23% had some kind of hours cut from their job. And this problem was especially the case among younger APIs as about half of those between the age of 18 to 34 had experienced um, uh, some kind of loss of job or had their hours cut. And a lower, um, a lower proportion of older APIs had experienced employment issues during the pandemic. But apart from economic downturn, APIs have faced um, a large wave of anti-Asian hate and discrimination during the COVID-19 pandemic. Most recently, just today, a woman was viciously assaulted and hit in the head 125 times because she was Asian. And I'd actually like to take a moment to remember also the six Asian American women who were killed in Atlanta, Georgia, nearly one year ago tomorrow. Historically, anti-Asian violence is not new and continues through today. Looking to what some of our data um, shows on hate crimes and hate incidents, our survey found that 80% of APIs said that anti-Asian racism has been serious during the pandemic. 36% said anti-Asian racism has been extremely serious, while 44% said it, it was somewhat serious, or it is somewhat serious. This concern about anti-Asian racism is strongly shared across APIs of different national origin. Um, interestingly though, Filipino, Vietnamese and Japanese respondents were most likely to say that anti-Asian racism is a serious issue. Since the pandemic began, about two thirds of APIs have worried about being a victim of a hate crime. Again, this worry about becoming victim of a hate crime is shared among Asian Americans. Our survey results indicate that worry about anti-Asian racism and hate crimes is very prevalent in our API community, especially and even in Los Angeles County. And further, this concern about racism and hate has been personally experienced by large proportions of APIs. In the survey, we asked the following question. Have you been a victim of, have you been a victim of a hate crime since the pandemic began? That is, have you had someone verbally or physically abuse you or damage your property because of your race or ethnicity? And our survey found here that nearly a quarter of all APIs reported being a victim of a hate crime or incident during the pandemic. Across national origin, Japanese Americans, Korean, Chinese, and Vietnamese Americans 
were the most likely to report having been a victim of a hate crime. And we also find that native born um, and native born and younger APIs were actually more likely to report being a victim of a hate crime or incident during the pandemic. In addition, we find that gender across looking at the same question, we find that across gender, men and women experience shared, shared experiences with hate crimes. About 26% of men reported having been a victim of a hate crime, while a marginally lower proportion, 23%, reported the same among AAPI women. And this finding on age, gender, and hate incidents fits in well with the report on anti-Asian hate put together by leading political scientist, Dr. Janelle Wong at the University of Maryland, who also found that younger Asian American people are more likely than older people to report hate incidents and that different sources of data show distinct patterns of hate against API women and men. Our survey fully makes clear that Asian Americans are not just facing a public health crisis, but one of increased racial discrimination and hate even in the specific area of Los Angeles County. Further, apart from hate during the pandemic, about half of APIs in our survey reported experience of discrimination because of their race or ethnicity. This experience of racial discrimination is shared across national origin groups with um, Japanese Americans being the most likely to say that they've experienced some form of racial discrimination. We wanted to dig a little bit deeper actually into where this discrimination was happening in the AAPI community. And while other surveys have also reported that discrimination happens in, for example, public streets and parks, the Paparon Institute's Voice of LA API survey found that discrimination, um, there, there is a lot of discrimination that APIs face in everyday life. 45% said that they experienced discrimination actually in the workplace. And APIs also continue to experience um, continued discrimination in schools, grocery stores, and in public transportation as well. It's really important to note that despite these increases in hate incidents and, and um, hate incidents against Asian Americans uh, and, and a lot of worry about racism during the pandemic, when asked the degree of discrimination that different racial and ethnic groups face, APIs in LA were actually most likely to say that African-Americans faced the most discrimination. 47% of APIs said Blacks faced discrimination, faced a lot of discrimination, while 31% of Blacks uh, faced some discrimination. While APIs were the most likely to recognize that African-Americans um, faced a lot of discrimination, 38% said Asian Americans, and 33% of Latinos, 33% uh, of Asian Americans said that Latinos face a lot of discrimination. So similarly, respondents noted that a large proportion of immigrants more broadly face a lot of discrimination. Our survey also shows that there is not a lot of belief among APIs in Los Angeles that whites face discrimination in society. In light of the hate and discrimination against APIs, um, the community in LA has shown very strong levels of racial solidarity with other Asian Americans. We ask respondents the extent to which they saw themselves as Asian Americans, and about half said that they thought, them, thought of themselves quite a lot as Asian American. Um, in total, uh, about 81% of APIs in our survey said that they saw themselves as some, a lot, or quite a lot as an Asian American. We also measured in the survey APIs degree of what political scientists call link fate with others. We found that 64% believed that what happens generally to Asian Americans in this country will have something to do with what happens in their own life individually. So this suggests that there is a strong sense of solidarity with the Asian American community, especially in times of pandemic, hate, and discrimination. 
So moving from that first section, we'll now transition into illuminating a little bit about the politics of APIs in Los Angeles County. When asked what are the most important problems facing the Los Angeles area, 54% said that homelessness was the top issue. An AAPI prioritization of homelessness echoes actually what many LA mayoral candidates have also claimed to be the most pressing issue facing Los Angeles. AAPIs also continue to see COVID-19, jobs, and healthcare as important issues along with similar proportions, saying that both crime and racial justice are key issues facing LA. Looking a little bit deeper into views on homelessness, since APIs prioritize this the strongest, um, we asked an additional question. When asked if they would pass a ballot measure to issue and to increase sales tax in order to fund supportive services and housing for homeless individuals, more than a majority, 57%, um, of APIs said they would vote yes. And Vietnamese Americans, Indian, Korean, and Filipinos uh, are also strongly in favor of supporting a ballot measure or the most strongly uh, supportive of supporting a ballot measure to aid the unhoused. When asked about their views on policing, the most common preference for police funding among APIs was to stay the same, about the same. 42% of APIs um, said that funding on police should stay about the same. And a notable pr proportion also said that police funding should increase while APIs were the least likely to say that police funding should be decreased. When breaking this down across national origin, a lot of differences emerge. About half of Indian Americans um, and Chinese Americans were in favor of police funding remaining the same. And this is while views on increasing funding a little for police is more prominent among Vietnamese and Korean Americans. There's a smaller proportion uh, that supports decreasing funding for police departments and differences in national origin also emerge there um, that definitely needs more consideration. However, given time constraints, I'll go ahead and move on for now as there's a little bit more to cover. Um, in terms of partisanship, it is clear that Asian Americans lean democratic. And this echoes some of my own research, which has demonstrated how exclusionary rhetoric by various GOP leaders during the pandemic has pushed Asian Americans towards the Democratic Party. And there is some national, there is variation, of course, in identification with the Democratic Party. The highest proportion of Democrats in LA among APIs are seen among Indian Americans. However, large shares of Japanese, Korean, and Filipino Americans in LA also identify with the Democratic Party. Smaller shares of APIs across national origin identify as a Republican. Notably, um, in line with a plethora of political science and political behavior research, there is a large proportion of APIs that are identified as either an independent or with neither of the two major political parties. And this is especially the case in LA for Chinese and Vietnamese Americans. 42% of Chinese Americans um, identified as a, uh, as a independent or not identified with either of the two major parties, as well as 40% of the same among Vietnamese Americans. Our survey also, a survey of APIs also kind of gauged feelings towards various politicians on the national, state, and local levels. We found that more than a majority of Asian Americans hold unfavorable views towards former President Donald Trump. 57% held, held unfavorable views of Donald Trump while only 37% held favorable views. And this favorability is largely driven by API Republicans. APIs are also rather approving rather than disapproving of Democrats, uh, Democratic elected officials uh, when the survey was fielded in November to December of 2021, majority of APIs held favorable attitudes towards Joe Biden, 45% um, uh, either strongly approved or somewhat approved of Newsom's job in office, Governor Newsom's job in office, and also a lower proportion, um, 38% approved of Mayor Garcetti's handling of um, his job in serving the public here in LA. 
Our last segment here highlights the extent to which Asian Americans have been involved in various dimensions of politics, ranging from voting to protest. Our survey asked whether it was respondents actually first time voting in the recent California gubernatorial election. And we found that many, about 18% of APIs, voted for the first time. And this was especially high among US born APIs, Chinese American, and Vietnamese Americans. Looking to the 2020 midterms, many are enthusiastic about voting. 64% of APIs said that they were very likely to turn out to vote and 28% said they were somewhat likely to vote in 2022, and a much smaller proportion noted that they had no interest in the upcoming midterm election. Relatedly, APIs overwhelmingly said that it would be important to them that another Asian American represented them in public office. Fully 84% said that representation would either be somewhat or very important to them. So representation of other APIs in politics is desired, is clearly desired among APIs in LA. While I mentioned earlier that many Asian Americans are excited to vote in the upcoming midterm election, our survey also illuminated that many API voters lack sufficient outreach to be able to vote by major political or community organizations. 58% were not recruited to vote in the previous election cycles. And this proportion um, of those who are not recruited to vote um, is much higher among um, actually APIs than we found in our Latino survey that we released two weeks ago. This problem of under recruitment among the API community is especially prominent among perhaps those that may need outreach the most, including foreign born voters. This is especially concerning also for the API community because a large proportion of the API population is in fact foreign born, perpetuating this problem. Many Chinese, Filipino, Korean, Indian, and Vietnamese Americans were also heavily not recruited in previous election cycles. Apart from voting, APIs have been making their voice heard in many different ways. We asked whether respondents have had the opportunity to do any of the following actions, either in person or online in the last two years. Discussion of politics is the most frequent among APIs, dispelling the notion that APIs are non-political and are not interested in politics. Conversations about politics, especially among family and friends are common, and further apart from discussion, we find that 32%, for example, have posted about politics on social media, and a similarly high proportion have also signed a petition about a political issue of interest. We find that there has been relatively solid rates of participation in other modes of political action, such as protesting, um, where we find that 18% of APIs have attended a rally or protest in the last two years. Across all modes of political participation, we lastly find convincing evidence that in the wake of racial discrimination, Asian Americans have not withdrawn from politics, and instead APIs have become more active. Discrimination has motivated political action. We find that APIs who have experienced racial discrimination are more active in politics compared to APIs who have not experienced racial discrimination. And this is consistent across all the different ways to engage in politics that we asked on the Voices of LA survey. For example, we find that 23% of APIs who experienced racial discrimination have contacted an elected official, while 11% of APIs who had not experienced racial discrimination have completed that same action. And this is the same thing across donating to political organizations as another example. APIs that have experienced racial discrimination were nearly twice as likely to donate than those who had not experienced racial discrimination. So fully, the AAPI community has not been silent. The API community has responded to racial discrimination with even more involvement in politics, making their voices heard. In the era of COVID-19 and anti-Asian, the, the era of COVID-19 and anti-Asian hate has the potential to have ushered in a contemporary wave of API political activism. 
So with that, um, thank you all for your attention to some of just the highlights of the survey. There's obviously so much more that we'd like to cover in this presentation that we're um, happy to discuss in the panel discussion and also um, in future events. But thank you very much uh, for your time and attention here. Thank you, Nathan, for that really excellent presentation. And we're, we're right on time. And I am going to introduce our panel uh, very quickly, and then we're going to have a discussion um, the rest of the time. Uh, first, I want to introduce Manjusa Kulkarni, who we call Manju, who is an old friend of the Pat Brown Institute. Uh, Manju is the executive director of the AAPI Equity Alliance and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate. Uh, one of the major organizations in the country right now on these issues. Uh, and she was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential individuals and Bloomberg Business Week as one of the 50 individuals, the ability to move markets or shape ideas. Uh, that's really quite remarkable. Um, uh, Leanne Chen, where are you, Leanne? Can you put your um, camera on for us? The executive director of Career Girls in Action. She's a 1.5 generation refugee from Cambodia, grew up in the Bay Area and has spent two decades working in low income communities of color. Former director of the Movement Activist Apprenticeship Program at the Center for Third World Organizing. And in 2014 was appointed to President Obama's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Thank you for joining us, Leanne. Delighted that you're with us today. And our third panelist, uh, whose writing I read all the time in the LA Times. Uh, Frank Xiong, where are you, Frank? Thanks, Frank. He's a columnist for the LA Times, writing about diversity and diaspora in LA. He grew up south of Nashville, Tennessee, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit, and moved to LA in 20, 2006 to study economics at UCLA. He joined the Times in 2012, so he's now a veteran at the Times, having been there for a decade. Previously reported on the San Gabriel Valley, Chinese immigration to the Southland and the Asian American community. And uh, I just read his latest column, uh, which is very relevant uh, to the topic we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna ask questions for each of you and we'll do a little back and forth as well. Leanne, let's talk about voters. We're in the middle of an election year. The data that Nathan presented has some fairly disturbing stuff about outreach, especially for the foreign born. And you're involved all the time in uh, what people may have heard of called integrated uh, voter outreach, which is a kind of a very important thing. Well, what's your comment on this? And what does this all mean for people who are trying to get participation to increase? Yes, um, thank you for that. Um, I, you know, first, I think I, I want to thank um, CCF, PBI, and the rest of the team for investing in the diverse community voices here in LA County. Um, this is literally one of the largest sampling of AAPI residents I've seen. And the data hungry side of myself was super excited um, to, be, <laughs> to be digging into um, you know, so much information. Um, I think it's not often um, that the API community see ourselves reflected in such a, a, a large flow of data and analysis. And for a community that often feel invisible in the political landscape, the data that we're seeing today really show um, a community worthy of engagement. So this past decade, um, KGA have um, in our electoral organizing work, we have shifted from engagement during election cycles to year round engagement. So the integrated voter engagement. Um, and we made this organizational shift because in our experience in the field, um, doing door knocking and phone banking, most AAPI voters do not get outreach to um, by elected official and um, other campaigns. And oftentimes we are the first group that have reached out to them about upcoming election. Um, we are the first to ask, ask them about issues they care about. And we often help folks dispel misinformation and offer a counter narrative. Um, and that, you know, and we have really seen um, how important um, that is for a lot of um, AAPI voters. Um, the thing that, you know, really stood out to me um, in some of the data um, that we're looking out, uh, that we're looking at today. Um, it's not only about the percentage of AAPI voters who say they're planning to vote during the midterm election, but the percentage of no party preferences. 
right? That also really stood out to me because oftentimes political parties are often the predictor of how people may vote. However, when you have no party preference, that means that wedge issues can show up more prominently. And what this means is that the AAPI population are persuadable and it's a very movable metal. So the problem here is that there are simply not enough investment put into talking to our, put into talking and outreach into our communities. While there are trends that we're seeing, um, the trends that we are seeing around progressivism, you know, we, we also know that wedge issue can show up. And when people are left to figure it out by themselves, then we are also conceding ground to the conservatives. And given the population growth here in, in LA County, um, AAPI voters are really important because given that it's one of the most diverse and it's also a very diverse concentration of swing voters. Now, the other thing that really stood out to me as well is, you know, with a shared experience of discrimination and racism and a belief that people of color, especially black people face the most discrimination, there are possibilities to join together, together across racial lines. And I'm excited about that. Quick follow-up question on this. If, if, if a candidate for office came to you and said, I want the magic formula for reaching out to this community. Well, of course we know there's no magic formula. <laughs> Based on talking to people year round and hearing what they care about, how would you recommend they make their first contact with voters they've never talked to before? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things that, um, that emerged for me around this. Um, I think the data that um, Nathan showed us around that AAPI residents do pay a lot of attention to news about politics. And oftentimes they talk to their family members um, around um, issue around government and, um, and politics. Um, and so, um, so I, I do feel like there's, there's a couple of things that folks can do. Um, number one, invest in relational organizing, um, meaning that invest in organizing that is relational based um, so that we're talking to our friends and family members um, and finding the right um, folks um, to help shape your outreach strategy. So I think being able to do the type of outreach and reach out to um, either community organization or trusted leaders in some of the um, AAPI communities uh, would be really helpful. Um, I would also, um, you know, talk to um, have folks think about how they might want to invest and engage in ethnic media as well. Um, while 50% of respondents say that they rely on English language sources, we also see 37% say that they rely on both English and Asian language sources. And this still shows how significant ethnic media continue to be for um, the Asian American population. Thanks, Leanne. Manju, you have been at the center of the issue about anti-Asian hate. Does this, reson does this data resonate with what you're seeing everywhere? And how do you, how do you make it real to people? Because we're looking at numbers. And you're dealing with this all the time. What's your take on, on the standing of this right now? Thanks, Ray, for that question. And it's just such an honor to be with you, Nathan, uh, Leanne, and Frank. And just also want to express my appreciation to CCF for funding this important work and Ephraim especially for his vision about it. And of course, as you mentioned, Ray, if we go back um, to the days of the AAPI Civic U yep, that we yep. did together and, and hope like it, we can do again. Um, in the coming year. So yes, this absolutely, um, I think, is confirmed by some of what we're seeing at Stop AAPI Hate. Um, across the nation, we have received 11,000 incident reports from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Specifically in LA County, we've received 1,000 incident reports, and that's 500 in the city of LA alone. Um, and uh, I think in terms of some of the survey data uh, nationally, uh, we did a survey with the Edelman firm that found 20% of our community members, AAPIs had experienced some form of discrimination uh, in the last 18 months. Pew Research Center found that it was 45%. So we're talking about anywhere between four to 10 million individuals in our country who have experienced 
an act of hate. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that, you know, when we look at this, um, you know, what we have seen is uh, hate incidents really make up the vast majority. Uh, that is 85 plus percent do not involve an underlying crime or criminal element. And so I think what that speaks to is the fact that, you know, when folks are engaging politically, we really need to think about comprehensive solutions. And we know that policing is not simply going to be the solution or answer that we need for our communities. And that's even verified by um, some of the survey data in terms of what our community members want to see. Andrew, let me follow up here. Something in the data that I found intriguing, which is that younger native born folks tended to report at higher levels anti-Asian hate. And I'm wondering if there's a reporting issue here in a certain sense, which is you would think that the most vulnerable people would be older foreign born people, but the ones reporting it, or is this a question of being more conscious of the injustice in a sense, or what, what's your take on that? It's striking data. It's absolutely both. And, and that's a really great question because we do see that with uh, some law enforcement entities, there's not the language access, um, there's not necessarily responsiveness to our communities. And of course, for many of them who have immigrant backgrounds, they are worried about ICE and immigration enforcement. So that is definitely going to have an impact. But I think you're also right in terms of the consciousness. And we know in survey after survey, those who are native born and have grown up in the US are more likely to you know, look around and see their classmates, their colleagues, and know that the treatment and that they're receiving is different than what white counterparts are experiencing. And sometimes I think with um, you know, our older elder community members, uh, they either don't have that same vantage point or I think you know, they're having so many struggles that simply putting food on the table is of greater concern um, and they don't unfortunately have the time and the wherewithal to report. I think that's why the language issue is also so important here. Great, thank you. So Frank, you're in the middle of, in a sense, trying to make a contribution to how the media perceives these communities. I say these communities because these are multiple diverse communities. What do you think is not being reported or could be reporting better uh, so that the community sees itself reflected in media coverage, but also so that other communities come to a better understanding? Uh, well, I just think we need more, first of all, you know, coverage of uh, the day to day lives um, of Asian Americans. Um, but yeah, you know, on the issues we've been speaking out before, you know, a type of representation I'd like to see more people advocate for is for people who can't speak English, you know, by having speaking English and having a Twitter account, I feel like you're more represented than um, every single Asian immigrant who doesn't speak English. <laughs> And so um, I think they're, one of the ways to measure success in, in the reporting of Asian Americans is, is, is how is the fluency of the general public um, in terms of distinguishing between Asian Americans, um, in terms of knowing individual immigration stories and being able to understand them through knowledge rather than stereotypes, there's still a long way to go, you know? Um, we have this national Asian American conversation that is important, but it also sometimes um, obscures the, the individual conversations that, that need to occur. Um, and this is why data is like, so surveys like this are so important. You know, they're, they're the, the scaffolding that, that leads us to a, a, a more substantive discussion about these issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's my answer. You know, Frank, you and I have talked a bit about the focus on anecdotal cases when we talk about anti-Asian hate and how that can sort of shape people's understanding of what's been going on. You want to talk about that a little bit and, and, and how we have to move beyond that? Yeah, um, that's one of the things that I've personally found very difficult in reporting on this. You know, I can't just look at the video clip and make a conclusion that it was a racist incident, you know. 
And I also don't have the time to check into every single clip and establish whether or not is it a racist incident. And um, the federal standards for hate crimes are so uh, stringent that hardly any crime rises to that. You basically have to be you know, shouting a racial slur while punching someone in the face uh, with a witness. You know? <laughs> and uh, th that, that's how you could, um, that's how you could, uh, and, and so I guess like with, um, with uh, sort of hate crimes, um, there's just this higher bar that you have to get across. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it's really difficult to divide the conversation between anti-AAPI hate crimes and a rise in anti-AAPI racism. You know, the latter I'm more comfortable discussing because that's self-evident. You know, the other one must be established through comprehensive reporting. And I don't think we're very sophisticated right now in making those distinctions, are we? No, no. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, uh, we want the issue to gain traction and gain attention. And, and to do that, we need we need data and we need um, information like 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 you have in this report. One of the most surprising things for me was, was, um, was the statistics that Manju was mentioning, were the statistics that Manju was mentioning about uh, 25 to 40% of Asian Americans experiencing a hate incident. That's much higher than I thought it would be. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm gonna take one break just to highlight something, which is because a number of the questions are sort of factual questions about the survey. I'm gonna encourage Nathan and our BSC part, BSP partners to answer them online. So feel free to answer all those so we can keep the conversation going. There's a lot of striking differences in the survey between older foreign born residents and younger native born residents. And of course the great majority of the youngest folks are native born. And I wanna go in reverse order. Frank, what's your take on the on the on the sort of dialogue? Remember, people are talking, saying they talk about politics with family and friends, so that means you're crossing those boundaries, right? And what's your sense of that? That's that's a really important kind of internal dynamic within these communities. Yeah, um, my own experience of both Asian and Asian American politics is that there's a stark generational divide. You know. My cousins in Taiwan don't talk to my uncles <laughs> about politics because they scream at each other, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think that that um, it's natural that that certain divisions, you know, appear in the uh, AAPI community as well. You know, parents are politicized entirely differently from their children. You know, and uh, we all, you know. Uh, succeed and struggle to varying degrees on, on how to talk to our parents, how to cross that language barrier that we have with our own relatives. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, that more and more of those conversations do occur. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my parents and I tend not to talk about politics either, you know. Um, you know, their politics are formed from lived experiences that I consider valid, you know? So I would never try to um, talk them out of that. Okay. Leanne, what do you think would be the best use of this data going forward? You know, if we could do anything with this data, all of us on this call and everybody listening, what's the best use so we don't waste any of this knowledge? Yeah, um, I actually really love um, the idea that, you know, folks have already brainstormed around thinking about how we democratize this data, how we get this out mm -hmm. um, to um, a broad audience. Um, so um, both folks who work directly with the, you know, in the front line with community members, um, those who are engaging the, the civic engagement um, of our community members. Um, and I think as well as elected official and government officials um, who are also interested in thinking about how they engage the AAPI population. Um, the other thing that I think would be really great is for us to think about how we leverage our diversity as a blessing and a strength here in LA County and continue to disaggregate data 
so that we could understand different AAPI ethnicities. Um, and really make um, so that we could encourage folks to make um, AAPI um, population a part of folks' plan for both the organizing and the outreach. Great, Nathan. Leanne was just talking about kind of future things that could be done. Not all of us are polling experts. Um, disaggregating data, cross tabs. There's a lot of potential. Could you briefly, in layman's terms? talk to everybody about what could yet be unearthed out of this data that might be helpful to their work and, and their lives? Sure, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that we haven't looked at. I mean, we wanted to highlight, you know, everything ranging from differences in the API community among national origin, um, especially as I was answering in the chat and I addressed in the beginning, we're gonna do a little bit uh, more of an in-depth analysis specifically of Pacific Islanders and how they are um, unique and also compare in and to with the broader Asian American community. Um, we also plan to do a lot of uh, unique analysis across age and gender and kind of all the above. So um, we find it like really important to kind of dig into these differences across the API community. And people can reach out to us and say, I'm really curious about where gender plays a role, where age plays a role, and we'll work with you and try to get more of that information out. Manju, you were answering a few questions that were addressed to you. Do you wanna share it with everybody? Sure. Um, so, you know, among the answers that I've added um, to the q and I think, you know, again, I wanna sort of reiterate that most of these are not crimes. And to Frank's point that he made earlier, there is a high bar, especially with federal hate crimes laws and enforcement. Um, and even here in California, the state auditor did a report about hate crimes prosecution. And there are a number of challenges with that. But the good news is there's also redress for hate incidents. And people don't know that we have a Department of Fair Employment and Housing that actually take these incident reports. And here in LA County, we have not only LA versus hate, which can provide victim resources. This is a collaborative of uh, LA County Human Relations Commission with organizations like mine and special service for groups and others to provide those resources in language and culturally competent ways. I think we, there is a lot we can do outside of the enforcement mechanism. And so I wanna just urge people to think about that. And also, you know, in terms of solutions, we have three bills we've introduced into the California legislature. Um, one is to address street harassment, uh, which we know to be ubiquitous and really harming uh, not only AAPI women, but all women in our state. Number two is um, rider safety and public transit. And number three is civil rights and public accommodations and retail. So I think all of those offer ways for us to really get at what's going on and not simply engage in further policing and mass incarceration. That's great. Frank, you and I talked a little bit about what, what we mean by the term mainstream. We had kind of, I thought, a good conversation about that. Can you kind of walk us through? Because it affect, it means a lot for your role as a prominent opinion journalist and writer. So what's your thought about that? Um, yeah, you know, one of my sort of things about Los Angeles and 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 way, things I, my intellectual project, you know, I guess, if, if you can call it that, is to to try to get, you know, to 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 have a, a an acknowledgement that there are many mainstreams, you know, I've just had the experience of trying to report on trends um, that are happening, say, in nine zero zero three nine or nine zero zero two nine, and they don't happen in nine one eight zero three. Those are Alhambra and uh, uh, East Hollywood, you know, and so there is a huge enclave economy and enclave politics, enclave. Uh, uh, society, you know, that is just, that is not really being included in the way we talk about Los Angeles and think about Los Angeles. Um, and so that, that, that's, uh, that's really something I'd like to, uh, work on, you know, um, one of the reasons people, if you read a different newspaper, you're always going to have a different political opinion. Um, you know, immigrants have always been extremely politically engaged, as as people mention in the chat. You know, um, 
it's just uh it's just been in homeland politics um, for the most part, you know? Um, and so the bandwidth for American politics, you know, I think most of us could only really <laughs> follow one country's politics um, effectively. So, uh, so yeah, you know, um, I think for maybe 30 years, 40 years, the city has been majority minority and uh, our conversations about the city have not updated to really include that fact, um, or in, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Very helpful. Leanne, I'm curious about something about politics that appeared in the Latino survey as well. In LA County, these two communities aren't big fans of the Republican Party, but that doesn't mean they're totally locked into the Democratic Party or that the Democratic Party has really sealed the deal. They tend to be progressive on many issues, but are often as not will describe themselves as moderate, not liberal, and sometimes liberal, not moderate, but very rarely very conservative. So this dynamic of treating AAPI community as like, like a poker chip in the game of politics that has an orientation, you were saying before, it's a group that's really in play and really open to discussion, maybe just not so open to Donald Trump's kind of discussion. But that doesn't mean that they're completely, anyway, I'm talking too much. I wanna know what you think of that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, so this is, this, you know, this is what I'm, I'm thinking about that. For me, um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that there's, there's, um, there's a huge sector in our population um, that is not interested in um, affiliation with any political party. Um, and part of that is some of the dynamic um, that Frank um, talked about in terms of like the engagement in homeland politics, but also the being sick and tired of the nasty political uh, mm -hmm. rhetoric. Um, and then the other thing too, is just like, I, I think there's just such a missed opportunity um, when folks don't take seriously, um, you know, the AAPI voting population. Um, they are such a huge swing voters and they are so persuadable and movable if given the opportunity to have um, direct conversation. Um, that's something that we found um, when we do our field operations and when we talk to um, a lot of the AAPI voters. Um, some of the root causes of what I'm seeing with how folks are thinking about some of the issues, you know, some of the wedge issues that might emerge during an election cycle, um, and a lot of the, the issues sometimes that we're seeing during um, ballot measure fights um, is that um, how folks consume media and where they're getting their media has such an impact um, and like what are inf what are correct information or misinformation and oftentimes people do rely on family members and friends um, to give them certain information now if that information um, is coming from an unreliable source um, there's not always um, a reliable source for people to check some of those information. And this is where being able to provide a counter narrative is really important. Um, and because there's no real um, de um, like dedication to a political party, there's such a huge um, kind of like in the middle. Um, I just think that there's a lot of opportunities um, for folks to actually talk to, um, you know, the AAPI uh, community and provide and persuade them to be on their side. You know, this is your opportunity to be at play. So, so I think um, having a strong outreach um, and also really thinking about like what the strategies might be for the different ethnic community because folks do swing quite differently under the AAPI umbrella. And, and I think I wanna make that really clear um, because there's also a lot of class differences as well as ethnic differences um, in the AAPI community. And I think understanding those differences and how to frame up our messages um, along the various community makes a huge difference in terms of how you could potentially get the swing voters to vote on your side. What a wonderful ending for our conversation. We're almost out of time. I want to tell people, because people have been asking both factual questions and others, that in our view, this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. With our panelists and with all of you and others and organizations and universities and in politics, uh, Nathan and Matt and I and our team are going to dig more and more deeply into this data. And if there's stuff you want to know, we'd like to share it. We do believe, along with Ephraim, 
that of in the democratization of this data so that it's useful and really brings about change. But mostly we're looking, as Leanne just so well said, for a, a new fresh conversation. You don't have to just do the same old things in politics that you've done election after election, talking to the same people in the same way. Maybe it's time to have a fresh look. I would like to thank once again our friends and partners at CCF, the California Community Foundation, for both the funding and the partnership. Uh, Efrain Escobedo and Antonia Hernandez have been with us on this from the start. Uh, I want to thank the staff of the Pat Brown Institute, the staff of the California Community Foundation, and the staff of Communications and Public Affairs at Cal State LA. Thank all the reporters who are writing about this and all the reporters and other journalists who are on the call right now. And we're happy to answer any questions. And I'm going to volunteer our three guests to answer questions if you want to call them. Uh, and ask them to elaborate. And Nathan, I want to thank you and recognize you for your great work on this. And uh, uh, that we're glad we still have you for a while before you go off to your next, your next moment. Thank you all, everybody. Have a great day. And let's keep talking about this. <laughs>